team is one of the best guitar players I've have heard. It's crazy that I have not seen him playing live yet. I keep looking at dates. Someday I will see him. He seemed to have applied a lot of different styles and approaches with some killer Ted Green, Lenny Bro and Joe Pass adaptations applied to jazz and blues. Look up the Telebasher on YouTube or order this Tim Lerch trio live at Emerald City Guitars. DVD, so masterful in subtle ways that I get something new out of his music every time I listen to it. I can say enough good things about Tim's work. This is one of the uh, testimonials, uh, reviews I find in internet when I look uh, for, or I search it for our next guest, uh, Tim Lurch. Tim, welcome to Disrupt Everything Podcast Series. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to uh, visit with me and get to know each other a little bit. Tim is a disruptor that I want to introduce you. But before we go into the intro of the podcast, so I guess and I and I know you're going to be disrupted. I've taken lessons and workshop from Tim. Have seen playing several times, and I can tell you, he is the real deal. Technically rich, chops over the moon, and a good guy besides. Very good at explaining complex topics and not looking down his nose at us, the lesser players. Steve, in the another another review about the team teamwork. Who is Tim Lurch? He works in a, he's a jazz and blues guitarist, tone, taste, and telecasters. World-renowned guitarist, educator, and an Emmy Award-winning composer, Tim is a member of a legendary Northwest Gypsy Jack Grobe Pearl Django, and popular duo with Jim, Jamie Finley. In between gigs um, with Pearl Django and Jamie, Tim tries to play as many solo guitars performance as he can fit into the schedule. In addition to his live playings and recording schedule, Tim is also a well-respected and popular teacher with a, I can tell you for the reviews I've seen, with a busy schedule of private lessons, classes and workshops. His recent activities include a new master classes courses with True Fire, Jazz Guitar Camps with Frank Vignola and institutional DVDs for Hart Leonard Publishing. Masterclass videos for jazzguitarsociety.com and regular column in a fingerstyle guitar journal. For those players who don't uh, live near Seattle, Seattle uh, for, who don't, uh, sorry, for those players who don't uh, live near Seattle, Tim now offering, uh, is offering private lessons by, uh, by Skype and Zoom. Tim is also a guiding teacher in the Guanghum School of Zen. He received Inca recognition from Saint Master Sengsan in 2001. From 2000 to 2006, Lerch was the abbot of the Providence Saint Center, the head temple of the Guanghuma School Zen in America. He has trained extensively in the US and Asia from 1995 to 1999. Lerch also was the resident uh, director of the Guanghuma School Center in Seattle. Prior to joining the Guanghuma School, he trained uh, in the Japanese and the Vietnamese Shen traditions. Tim was an ordained monk uh, in 1996 after serving as a monk for 10 years. And he returned to Lai life in 2006. In 2006 and he's currently a musician and a music teacher living in Seattle. Seattle, right? Am I doing right? Seattle. Seattle. Okay, Seattle. Uh, sorry for my rusty English. Sometimes plays a bad, uh, bad, bad, bad guitar. Huh? <laughs> Tim, uh, with this such an amazing and a uh, really disruptive and 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 uh, non common uh, like life lifetime of yeah projects lifetime. Um, we we thrilled to have you here in this Rope Everything podcast series. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. It's a little embarrassing hearing all of those things um, about uh, being said about me, but I suppose it's it's uh, 
tax of admission. <laughs> it's the work you've done, right? It's, so yeah. you keep busy yeah. doing the work. That's what you get. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tim, so welcome. This, this super everything is, uh, and the listeners are thrilled to have you, like someone like uh, interesting, uh, like activity, professional activity, and also his life as a monk and, uh, and, a, and a teacher of the Kwan Huma School. So the first question that comes to my mind is, uh, well, first of all, how are you? How do you feel? How I'm have you well. been? Yeah, I'm, I'm very good. You know, of course, we're all struggling a little bit with uh, the, the um, quarantine. We're still, I'm still staying locked down uh, until I get vaccinated. Um, maybe it's a little uh, looser now, but for me, I'm just staying home, working, uh, seeing people online and teaching uh, both music and also uh, in my uh, capacity as a Zen uh, teacher as well. Uh, I'm okay. I'm good. How about you? You're traveling. I'm, you're doing the hard work. <laughs> yes, I'm, uh, I'm trying to, to dance with the moment uh, as much as yeah. I can. I left uh, Spain in October. And uh, it was for a month, and I haven't come back. A lot of things have happened, like uh, some, like a really important family of my family member of my family has died from COVID. I couldn't go back, and uh, and uh, we're living in such an interesting times that you know, like everything is happening here and now. And uh, but it's we keeping coming back all the time. So, but uh, so far so good. Dancing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, if you dance with the moment, you have to be careful that nobody steps on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> I can dance and you can play the guitar, so we have a perfect couple. <laughs> Tim. Uh -huh. uh, so my if, <laughs> and the second question I would love to to uh, to address is uh, what what have been the experiences that has marked you the most over your life? And what they mean? Uh, what they mean to you? Uh, hmm. You know, I I'll have to reflect because I don't spend much time and energy uh, um, thinking about my life. <laughs> uh, I don't. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of energy and practicing time to be a moment person. And a moment person isn't um, playing a story of the past or a pr playing a story of the future or even playing a story of the present. Um, but I, I'll try and play along <laughs> as best as I can with your question. Um, transformative um, events. Uh, I remember when I was a very, very small child listening to a transistor radio. Do you know what a transistor radio is? You're old, yes. you're old enough. You know. it, was, yes. uh, it, was, <laughs> it was the original portable radio. And I remember um, being in uh, the bedroom um, where, I li where I stayed with my two older brothers and maybe even the baby brother um, and uh, listening to uh, pop music on the radio. That's a very early memory. Um, the first time I heard Charlie Parker was pretty transformative, I believe. Uh, Charlie Parker is a is a uh, American uh, saxophone player, a jazz musician, really innovative, probably the one of the most innovative. Uh, and I heard him, and it really blew my mind. I want immediately wanted to to play that way, um, even though I didn't play a saxophone. Um, that there's a lot of things that can occur in one's life. I'm not, I'm not sure I can pinpoint a particular moment. Um, you know, I had, um, I had an experience that in my early, uh, twenties, where I was playing music with two of my friends, and we'd played music quite frequently. And I was, um, at that time, beginning to play professionally, and you know, had been playing professionally since my teenage years, actually. Um, 
And we were just uh, in a building somewhere, just a, a drummer and a bass player and myself. And um, something interesting happened. The music was flowing, and I had an, a, had a kind of experience of um, sort of st- uh, lifting up and looking down on the proceedings. Uh, people say out-of-body experience. I'm not sure if that was what it was, but... I just had an expanded ex- experience of sort of the view of what was going on, what I was participating in. The music was very beautiful. It was improvisational, so it was spontaneous. Um, and I had a, an experience of almost uh, witnessing it happening rather than feeling like I was making it happen. And this was quite profound for me. It was something that I may have had glimpses of as a child, um, but here I was, a young adult, and I was having this kind of experience. Um, I can tell you more about that later as I, as we explore this whole question about meditation practice and Zen. But it was co- quite profound, and it led me in a certain direction. Uh, um, at first, to pursue that experience, and then, as as I understood a little bit more, uh, rather than trying to pursue that experience through music, rather um, try and and uh, find a way to practice so that I could have a type of experience uh, on some level like that in any activity. Um, so, so it occurred to me that making music uh, responsible for an experience is... is um, actually undermining the music itself. And when I realized that I was using music to try and get an experience, I realized that I was abusing the music. And the music was okay by itself. It didn't need to be anything um, more than what just what it was. And then uh, that led me to uh, my life as a meditator as well, because uh, meditation seemed to be a way of experiencing the moment in a thorough and depthful way, which didn't demand a certain type of activity in order to do that. Uh, and so that's that's still the path I'm on. In, how did you how did you get into professional music? How did you get into that? How do you step up in that professional field? That's a very interesting uh, and difficult question. Uh, <laughs> I think that um, as soon as I started playing, that was the only thing I wanted to do. That was the only choice. Um, my personality, I believe, maybe my karma, is um, kind of in one direction. Um, when I find something, I go, f- I throw myself into it rather strongly, rather than uh, in in the West we say dabbling. You know, uh, so my style is to dig one deep well rather than a lot of shallow wells. <laughs> um, and I don't say that to praise myself. It just seems to be the way. So when I was uh, 12 or 13 years old, to my parents' uh, chagrin, uh, I, I informed them that I was a musician and that that's what I was going to do. Now, how to do it professionally is still a question I'm trying to, to answer every day. <laughs> Because, as you might imagine, professional music is um, its a, a very difficult path. Uh, I feel like I've been fortunate, but it hasn't always been easy. But because I'm stubborn and because I don't have a, 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 fall black, a fallback plan, I don't have another choice, you know. So I, <laughs> I go with music and it's my only way to do it. Of course, I was a monk for about... Uh, a little over 10 years, maybe around 12 years. And during that time, I wasn't a professional musician. Um, and so that gives you an idea, maybe a, 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 some evidence of this uh, personal trend I have is throw myself completely into one thing. And then another thing is everything else stops. <laughs> so it's a, a little bit that style. I, when I was a monk, I was just nothing but a monk. I didn't know... Uh, what I was going to do or how long I was going to do it, um, but that's um, that's my that's my approach. Is I just do it. 
what did you what did you what did you what did it uh, influence you or push you or or convince you or to to be a monk to go to go to a monastic life wow. that's also an interesting question um i was playing music i had been playing music since i was a, a young teenager and it was really everything that i had um and uh, when I was about in my early 30s, 32 or so, um, I had been playing professionally. And at that time during in my life, I was teaching and playing professionally quite constantly. And to be honest with you, I had gotten a little, uh, a little broken inside, let's just say. Uh, music wasn't enjoyable. I was very um, capable. Um, my physical abilities on the instrument were quite good, I think, but my heart was not clear. My mind wasn't clear. I'll give you a little example. I didn't really love the professional life I was in. Uh, it was antagonistic also to my family life at the time, <laughs> um, having to go out into every night, you know, to play. Um, and I didn't really enjoy what I was hearing myself play. It didn't, it wasn't connecting to my heart to the extent that it, in a perverted way, someone would compliment me about my music. And I think they, I would think, well, you must be a fool if you think that that was good. Um, you know, and it was self punishing, I think, or self hatred. Um, the um, the end result was that uh, my life sort of fell apart at that time in my early 30s. Uh, there was a chance for me to make a change in my life. And I had been a meditation person for quite some years, only I didn't, um, I wanted to pursue it more st strongly because, uh, and I had the opportunity to sit a long retreat, a uh, three-month retreat in the winter of 1994. Um, I went to the Providence Zen Center, which you might have heard about. And uh, I spent about a month living in the Zen Center and working, uh, getting used to the, the life there. And then I sat this three-month retreat, and it was quite um, a profound experience. You asked earlier about profound experiences. Um, and uh, at the end of the retreat, I just, I didn't have really anything to return to. And, um, you know, I navigated some of the difficulties that were, you know, necessary to navigate and, and talked about my interest in monastic life. And I didn't know at that moment how long I would do it or if I would do it. I didn't really have an idea. It was I didn't say, oh, I'll do this for my life or I'll do this for um, a month or 10 years or whatever. I didn't really have that idea. I just had this just now do it mind. So right? that's what I did. I love the just now do it mind. Huh? Um, Tim, what? So one question I always wondered, and I want to ask you is, what blues means to you? What I, I love, I love blues, but uh, but I, I want to know what means for a professional uh, musician as you. What means to you, and what are the and what are the hard lessons you've you've had, uh, specifically, especially with blues? Well, thank you. That's an interesting and I think very important question as well. Um, Blues is African American music. It comes from the African American situation. So, someone like me, who is a, a, a white kid who grew up in the in a small town, I'm a kind of um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's not always clear. Uh, I'm not sure I can speak to what the blues is for anybody else but myself. But because I wasn't. Um, ethnically or culturally really in a blues uh, uh, karmic flow, <laughs> uh, 
I, I had to find my own real and honest and truthful way of addressing the, the music. Certainly there are things that on a technical level you could say um, are indicative of the blues. There's a sound, there's a particular harmonic backdrop, there's a culture um, of you know, where the music gets played and and it's a Saturday night music, if you will, where people drop away their the troubles of their week and have some relief from that. Um, but for me to personally, and this is very, it's very important that I say this, I'm not saying that this is what blues is, but this is my personal relationship to it. First of all, it's a sound. It's an idiomatic language that has certain um, parameters, but it's also an important uh, way of expressing something that's true about human nature in a, in a deep way. Um, it really almost promotes in its existence uh, the, the necessity for conveying a feeling when you play it. So when we play the blues, we're not thinking of technique or thinking of, of um, uh, Western harmonic rules or anything. We're, we're trying to imbue the music with a feeling that's true and honest. So for me, um, blues music ultimately is the truth about you in the moment. As, as it would be delivered in this package that we know as as um, blues music. Um, and then on a wider sense than that, I don't think that blues music is the l limit to where a blues feeling can be expressed. Mm -hmm. It's not just sadness or, or any kind of particular emotion. It's actually um, a way of expressing all emotions in a, in a fashion that Oh, can evoke the feeling in the listener. A feeling, not necessarily my feeling. So that's very, it's very interesting. I might put something into the music that is very clear to me or come out naturally or being sort of below the, the, the level of, of discursive thought. And a listener might feel something completely different because the music is filtered through their life experience. And because the music is simple, it doesn't co complicate your mind. So it actually allows for something else to appear in the experience. Uh, I hope that was clear. Wonderful, wonderful description and uh, really clear and uh, really inspiring. So, and, and what about what about jazz? What do you think uh, jazz has brought to your life? Well, I, probably I can answer it the same way. There are there are musical parameters that you know uh, we certainly don't all agree on. Nobody can tell you what jazz is. That's the interesting thing about it. You say, what is life? Well, everybody's answer to that question is going to be different. So, uh, jazz is again an African American music that came up through a certain era of time and has a long legacy uh, of rec and happily it's almost the entirety of jazz has been, uh, history has been recorded in some fashion. So you could say jazz came into being in the early 1900s. It was recorded as early as 1925 or 26. And some of the masters like Louis Armstrong um, actually recorded in, in very early recordings, you know, a representation of the music as it was developing. And it's... Um, you know, youth as well. So there's that, there's that, there's the history of jazz music and it, it, and it branches off into many directions. So that's a lifetime study just to study what jazz, the recorded evidence of jazz is and to try and understand it and to try and appreciate it. Um, uh, it, it got, it, it, ex, it's continues to expand. It's still expanding and contracting all of the time. Uh, for me, the feeling of I'm an improviser. It turns out that I'm an improviser. Uh, that's why I like um, what the, the message of Zen is. That Zen really, they don't use this language, but Zen really points to an improvised 
life. Um, uh, and it, a music improviser it lives in the moment world, and a Zen practitioner, Zen training and, and Zen teaching is pointing to um, living in moment world, the, the world as it unfolds. Moment to moment. Yes. But jazz has an interesting thing going for it that I also find appealing is that there's a um, uh, there's an intellectual capacity to it, so you have to understand some things. It's a, it's a. Um, uh, we deal with songs, and those songs are very, very beautifully crafted, very often, and the songs have difficulties built into them. And something that makes jazz interesting to play is the, the, um, the path you must take in order to be able to become fluent to be able to improvise freely, but also be technically in the tradition. Um, it's, uh, it takes skill on your instrument. It takes facility. Uh, the other thing that's fascinating, and I can appreciate this now more than I did when I was younger, is that the music changes you and it changes with you. Um, so I play differently now than I played when I even 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I've been playing I've been playing music and primarily jazz and blues for almost 50 years now, um, even though I look uh, barely over 20. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's this there's this maturation and evolution internally which is makes it possible to witness because you know we we play and we watch ourselves and listen to ourselves play um, but jazz is a kind of uh, also a celebration of joy um, one of the things that that brought me um, some clarity and continues to bring me clarity in uh, the midst of a busy performance schedule or uh, in the midst of of um, learning new material and being nervous about uh, about just the the issues of being a professional you know you have to learn a lot of music you have to be on on your game at the drop of a hat <laughs> so it says there's a saying that if if you always stay ready you don't have to get ready <laughs> And I think that's important to remember because sometimes we don't have the uh, luxury of, of you know, putting our mind in the right headspace or something. But sometimes that can be stressful. But what I try and remind myself of is what I'm here to share is joy. And by, by joy, I mean in the broadest sense of the word joy. I don't just mean happiness, although that's an aspect. And so if my job is to not share technical aspects of music or anything, but really boil it down to the essence is to share joy, transmit something from it that's true and authentic to me through my instrument into the world of sound. That's my job. That helps me because if I remember that, then a lot of the stressful stuff can fall away. And it just keeps me grounded in what... Um, regardless of the situation, uh, high profile situation with cameras and and recording or whatever it might be, or a radio uh, station thing, or just playing an intimate concert for uh, a smaller group of people, or even a rehearsal with my bandmates or practicing on my own, all of that boils down to the same thing is how can I tap into my own feeling of the joy of being and transmit that through the sound. What a wonderful uh, question that you left us in the, at, the, at, the, at the end of this uh, answer. The, this is why I was asking you about blues and jazz because I knew that uh, from your point of view that the mixture between the intersection between music and, and Zen life uh, could be an interesting answer and it's been like that. Uh, can, can you explain us what have you learned uh, working working in tone, taste, and telecasters that you can apply to real life? Uh, um, it is real life. Everything everything is real life. 
There's nothing to be applied. Um, so when I have a guitar in my lap, that's real life. Um, then uh, tone is, is um, the sound I make. And I've worked hard, continue to work hard on to try to make the instrument um, and the sound I make with the instrument transcend the mechanics of the instrument. Um, I call it invisible technique. Uh, that sounds fancy, but it just means I don't want the technique to be visible. I don't want the technique to be the thing that people notice. I want the sound and the beauty to be what is noticed. Taste, I think, is something that is arbitrary, um, but it also is a kind of musical morality. Um, what, what is true to you at any moment? What do you think is ultimately... Uh, authentic and correct in this moment. That's uh, what we bring forth. Um, chasing after approval, for instance, chasing after uh, impressive um, behavior in order to get noticed or have somebody or some group of people approve of you. Any of those kinds of things aren't um, valuable. It's very valuable to see if we're involved in that and then to step back and ask ourselves if it's beneficial. But ultimately, we drop that. Um, in Buddhism, that says there's five desires. Uh, the five desires, I'll list them really quickly, is uh, sleep, food, sex, uh, maybe money, I can't remember. And then the last one is fame. And I think fame is very interesting. Now, as a musician, we have to deal with the conventional meaning of fame. Uh, if we're, if I, and I know people who are almost willing to do just about anything in order to become, to get notoriety or to become famous. And sometimes that fame then uh, uh, folds over into the de other desires, money or sex or those kinds of things. Usually not sleep. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Hopefully but, not. Yeah, but I think fame is more applicable across the board. If we look at it and, and use a different word and we use approval, for instance, rather than fame, then we can look at how we're motivated very much constantly by appro approval. When we're young, we want the approval of our loved ones, our parents, our, mothers and, our mother or father, or our brothers and sisters. We want approval of our teachers, of our friends. Um, this kind of thing is makes it a little bit more egalitarian, this idea. It's not fame on, on the level of Elvis or uh, you know Michael Jordan. It, it's more about a desire to be thought well of by others. And if you look at it that way, that's a normal and natural and probably appropriate desire, unless, like many things, it gets blown out of kilter and, and we become obsessive or, or um, uh, too strongly desiring this thing. Um, and so even if I'm not playing guitar to become famous per se, I'm constantly uh, visiting this... I, this uh, uh, feeling of whether or not my playing is motivated by uh, unhelpful ideas, one of which can be the approval of others. Um, if I'm concerning myself in any particular moment on a performance or a recording with whether anybody's going to like what I do, uh, then it, there's, a, there's a gap, there's a veil, there's a, uh, I, I boxed myself in. And I don't allow myself to be true uh, and authentic in the playing. I'm only uh, thinking of an imaginary, I'm in the world of imaginary uh, likes and dislikes. <laughs> yeah. and, that, and, and that's not real life. You asked about real life. <laughs> that isn't real life. <laughs> so to be honest with you, I, 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 maybe I've worked my way around to this, but to... To be authentic and and let all of the concerns 
about what other people think of you fall away in the moment is your real life. It's the only time you get your actual real life. So we have a real life fantasy, which isn't our real life. It's actually an imaginary life. So perhaps the best way to say it is we have to show up in our actual life, which you called our real life, <laughs> by, letting go, by letting go of our idea about our life completely. Brilliant. Um, Tim, uh, Pearl Django was established in 1994, if I, my research was okay, uh, in Tacoma. Uh, and you did yes, uh, the Which is where I live now, by the way. Okay. I live in in Tacoma, uh, over and uh, you had over 16, 1, 6, 16 releases. So from all of these, what moments or milestone can you recall that has shaped you as a person and as a musician? Well, I have to say that the Pearl Django, Pearl Django, as uh, music is uh, devoted to the 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 memory, at least the memory, if not the legacy of Django Reinhardt, who was a famous French guitarist. The early, um, the, the founders of the band who had a, a few bands before Pearl Django became Pearl Django. Um, there was a, uh, another uh, early first record called Quartet Deluxe, which is, had the primary members of the band. It was started um, by this, these two guitar players, Dudley Hill and Neil Anderson. And I l heard about the band then, and I was living in Seattle in those days, um, and uh, heard about them and would hear them on the radio and those kinds of things. Uh, but I was not in the band because I was a monk at the time. Mm -hmm. Wow, how interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, and... Um, and then when I returned to lay life in 2006, I happened to um, meet the bass player in that band and play some jobs with him. And um, so I didn't join the band until 2006. Uh, and my first contribution to the band, other than playing live performances, was a, a, a CD called With Friends Like These. And that was very wonderful because um, I was the first, I was the new guy in the band. One of the original guitar players had returned to the band in order to, to uh, play again. He had retired and, and the band had two other guitar players. And then when I came in, there was a sort of a changing of the guard. Neil Anderson came back to the band and then I also joined. And uh, we made this record and played a whole, uh, a year's worth of jobs. Um, and they let me write four, or, or they put four of my songs on the CD. Uh, the songs um, were things I had written just before joining the band or for the band. Um, so out of, out of um, you know, 12 songs I had, or 12 or 13 songs, I had written four. And of course, then I played on all the rest of them as you do when you're in a band. And for me, that was um, very profound because it really made me feel like they they appreciated what I had to offer. They wanted me to do my thing. They didn't want me to pretend to be somebody else. They were clearly interested in what I wanted to play and what I could play and what my sound was, which was developed at the time. Um, did I say 2006? Yes. I, I really meant to, that's when I returned to Seattle. I, I got, I'm not so great with dates. I joined the band in 2015. Okay. And um, so I'm sorry if that was. No, confused. that's fine. No problem. And so, and then this, then I've been in the band since then. And since then, we've made um, three new CDs a live CD, and then the newest one's called Simplicity. And on every one of the records, um, and in all the gigs that we do, about, you know, 85 to 100 gigs a year. Wow. Um, uh, so it's a, you know, modest, you know, full-time gig. Um, it leaves enough time for other things, but it's enough to really sink your teeth into. Uh, <laughs> for me, to feel like I'm a contributing member of a band that has such a long history and is so well-received over time uh, is 
really moving for me to to first of all I I think about it from time to time and I'm just really fortunate I feel very fortunate um, to be able to be invited into the band to do what I do uh, because sometimes when you join a band you know you're you're asked to do the thing that the last guy did and they didn't want me to do that they wanted me to do of course we play a lot of the same songs and I play you know, parts that were composed or so that the audience can recognize what we're doing, you know. Um, but as far as how I approach my instrument, the sound I make, all that, they just said, no, no, we want you. And that that's a profoundly, for a musician who's been struggling my almost my entire life to be, um, to fit in and to find a home in a, in a situation, um, to be celebrated and welcomed is very, very important. And and uh, makes me feel very fortunate. Uh, Tim, uh, what's the be what's the before and after scene on Tim's life? Well, I don't think is there is an after yet, eh? but somehow, figuratively, we can think about. <laughs> well, before and after are opposites words, yeah. and they set up a kind of false, a falsity. Um, there's a notion that's floating around. Sometimes it's perpetrated by teachers, but generally speaking, that Zen is something that you do to help yourself to get better. I read a quote the other day that uh, said something like, it was one of these inspirational quotes. I think mm. I saw it on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Zen isn't to make your, uh, we practice Zen not to get better at Zen, but to get better at life. And on the surface, you think, oh, well, that's an interesting thing, you know, that that kind of uh, points to something bigger than just an activity. Um, but my response, my reaction to that was is better is still getting and getting getting is still getting whether we want to get better at life or get better at Zen or get better at anything. It's still setting up a a false dichotomy of opposites. I'm not better now and I will be better then. So I reject really the notion that there is a before and after. Um, and ultimately Zen is pointing to this moment which has no before or after. And what would you say then if, uh, if there is not before and after? So we have, we just have now. What uh, so is that a realization that ha that Sen has given you? Or do you uh, find that through Sen? I don't think Zen gives you anything. If Zen gave you something, it would mean that you didn't have something that you that could then be given to you. It's very, it's, it really is very, uh, an interesting uh, conundrum because we, so many people come to Zen because they want something and then very often they get a little something, uh, in at least imaginary something. They get a feeling or something like that. But ultimately Zen doesn't give you anything. Uh, it may help. <laughs> It may it, the practice of Zen may help you to see that you already have everything. But if if Zen is based on the premise that you need something from Zen, it's already wrong. It's broken. It can't help you. Uh, so it must be remembered that uh, we have these sayings. You know, Zen sayings famous are like selling water by the river or uh, selling. Uh, you know, giving away <laughs> sand. Giving away sand in a desert, uh, it, it means, uh, uh, you know, we're like fish swimming around in water and look, you know, it, the water is flowing through us in, in, in every possible way. And yet we're looking for the water. I love that. Uh, uh, so we all, you know, in Zen teaching, we recognize this sort of human need to get, attain, to attain. And so a lot of the language of Zen undermines that, disrupts that notion. And in some ways, Zen is very disruptive because if we want Zen to give us a good feeling, it might. But then it, our life 
flow, the unfolding of karma will snatch that good feeling away from us just as as easily as we got it. And then we can be disappointed or or spinning in the spinning in the world of 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 confusion and suffering, like we all do. So if Zen says if if a Zen teacher or a Zen tradition says, well, you're going to do this practice and you will get something as a result of it. Uh, that's um, a thief. That's a thief in the night. I heard, uh, I think it was from, I heard about, uh, I don't know if it was uh, Debon Sunim, who, which I interview also in my podcast. Yeah, but but uh, I heard that the uh, Zen is good for nothing. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. And then, <laughs> And then you must you must also continue because even if you believe Zen is good for nothing, you have to examine what this nothing is. Mm. Love it, Tim. Uh, is there any link or intersection between your life as a Zen musician and your life as a Zen teacher? Absolutely. The, the, my, there's no difference at all. There's no link because there's no separation. Uh, somebody asked me recently at a whole world is a single flower conference this very same question of how do i manage the busy life of teaching music playing music teaching zen being a householder making money and the only response i could bring out was i don't do that i don't manage compartments of a thing called my life. Um, and if I, if I see myself trying to do that, I, I uh, let go of that impulse. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm saying I have it all figured out, but uh, it, 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 is, it is important to remember that our life is this moment. Our, this moment doesn't have division. If we believe that our life unfolds moment to moment, then whatever you're doing in this moment is the entirety of your life. There's no um, uh, link between one aspect and another. It's, it's, it's one. What's the, what's the biggest learning you have had through Zen teachings or the big do you have any big realization of big teaching or learning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of big ones. There's a lot of little ones. Um, I, but one thing that jumps into my mind that I have to trust that it jumped into my mind for a reason is that there was a, a, a day um, I, was, I was living in the Providence Zen Center. I was a monk at the time. I had been a monk for quite a few years. And I was the head Dharma teacher or the head monk for the winter, three-month winter retreat, which is something that was my occupation at the time. I would uh, either be the head monk or uh, eventually later on be the gui the guiding teacher of the retreat or co-guiding teacher of the of the winter retreat and the summer retreat. So the winter retreat was finishing up. Uh, it was the last day. And the way the schedule on the last day went was we practiced in the morning. We had work period after morning practice. And then after work period, we would come back to the Dharma room all together, all of the participants, and we would have a closing ceremony. And um, that closing ceremony involved some treats for the participants and some, you know, logistics and some details that had to be uh, ironed out and I was presiding over making sure all the right things happened and everybody was in the play you know the head dharma teacher or the head monk's job is to take care of everybody during the retreat so I had this kind of mother's mind that comes naturally to me but was in, definitely in play uh, so during the work period I met with the the my teacher uh, who was the man the monk leading the retreat and he said something like how's How's it going? Uh, and I went into this list of things I were that I had checked off my list. Oh, I did this and I did this and that. Okay, this is okay. Everything's going great. Such and such and such. 
And a very interesting and profound experience happened for me. The teacher, uh, my teacher at that time, at, and I was very familiar with this monk, uh, De Kuang Sinim was his name, is his name. Um, we were close. We worked together every day, you know. But he looked at me, he patted me on the shoulder three times, and he said, Sinim, which is the monk's title, you're a wonderful person. And to this day, I don't know whether he said that with sarcasm or if it was <laughs> praise or if it was a little bit of both. I really don't know. But he, the way, the way things would unfold with him is that very seldom would I have a big profound moment in a teaching situation, like in an interview with the teacher or anything. But often it would be just in one of these kind of situations where we were just talking. You know, because we had developed this kind of bond and closeness. And it, what this spoke to me is that there was still some shred of this approval which, which I was talking about. I was telling him how good I was. I was telling him how, how wonderful I was. And then he just patted me on the shoulder three times, which is kind of zen <laughs> for, for, you know, punishment. I hit you 30 times. And, and he said... You're a wonderful person. And I heard it and it reverberated and it made me feel a little sick inside and a little, it turned me upside down a little bit and it disrupted um, wow. me in a way that made me realize even after all these years of serious training, I still wanted, I still wanted something. And I would probably continue to want something. So I better be vigilant about that. Because Wanting is a very slippery slope. It's very easy to slide down and uh, lose yourself in it. So that was a, I, I think that was a, a worthwhile thing to share. You do, you do. Thank you for, for sharing uh, this uh, intimate and personal moment. Yeah, you it do. was personal. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, welcome. You do online, uh, you do online sessions by, by uh, Skype, Zoom. What this, uh, especially nowadays, what this has taught you about uh, mastering a skill as playing the guitar when you do via Skype or Zoom? Um, mastery is interesting. I have a feeling about this. Uh, sometimes people refer to me as a master and I'm not comfortable with that. Um, but I think that's more about what they need to say rather than what I need to hear. Um, regardless of whether it's in the realm of Zen or guitar or anything else. Uh, I believe that we don't master something once or at, at a certain moment in time, and then, and then we are a master. Whether it be music or life or Zen, um, we, don't, we don't have a moment of where we are, have mastered something, and then from that moment on, we are considered someone who has mastered that. I think mastery is something we approach in every moment. The truth is, um, you know, the conventional notion of mastery is that you're finished, and I don't ever want to be finished. Hmm. I don't think being finished is, is helpful. Um, so I convey that to my students of all kinds. In all subtle and, and sometimes not so subtle ways. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, and, uh, how do you stay how do you stay productive combining combining personal and professional and, edu uh, and educational meditator sites? So, pro personal, professional, and educational from uh, guitarist play and also meditator. How do you stay productive? What do you do? Um, Those issues are so uh, profoundly um, woven into my being. I, it's hard for me to really, you know, uh, separate into some kind of idea of productivity or not productivity. I just, I'm, I'm stubborn and 
and stupid and <laughs> and, I, and i and i'm continue to to endeavor you know what i mean it, uh, yeah. i mean like how do you stick with brushing your teeth every day how do you how do you, how do you stick <laughs> with you know, you know, if you don't brush your teeth, you have the immediate reaction because then your breath is bad and your teeth don't feel good. And, you know, I mean, so there's if there are certain things we do every day, we don't think about them as being productive or, or good or bad or anything. We just do them because we have we must. And in some ways, it's that for me. I also have ebbs and flows, of course. But my my um, uh, brightness of mind and, and uh, willingness to you know, open up that case and put that thing on my lap or to sit uh, th that, you know, it's a wave, <laughs> you know, karma is, is always flowing. Have um, you, have you had any mentors that has a big impact on you? Um, it, yeah. Who and, and what anecdotes or teachings can you share with us apart from what you just share uh, with the, uh, Last well, in the realm of in the realm of music, I've had many, many fortunate encounters which influenced me. Of course, every time you listen to a recording, you're you're being influenced by someone who could, you know, be a mentor, even though they don't know that they might be dead and they could still be a mentor. Something of that tradition in music is we listen to the music of those who went before us and try and understand it. I've had teachers in music. Uh, a man named Ted Green was a, a very profoundly um, influential and important man in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Diorio, who's uh, still alive and living in his retirement in Connecticut, is a wonderful, wonderful musical father to me. I, I value my relationship with him. Uh, there's too many others to mention uh, without f leaving some out, um, but um, I feel very fortunate to have had long or brief encounters with many people who helped me, and I continue to. I, I like to avail myself to the wisdom of others. I, 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 uh, I always learn something when I um, am open to that. In, in my Zen training, I have had, again, fortunate to have met many, many teachers, whether they knew they were teaching me or not. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, De Kuang Sanim is profoundly important to me because we lived together so long and trained together, and he mentored me specifically. Bobby was also very important to me because uh, even though she didn't live at the Zen Center, she was frequently there because she lived in the neighborhood. And uh, I always was very uh, um, comfortable with her and gravitated toward her, her uh, energy. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's hard for me to remember and think of without saying hundreds of names, you know, just those, but that's. Thank you for sharing that. Can you, can you share with us, do you have any effective tool for personal development or something that uh, helps you to, to keep growing? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not sure if personal development is the way I would say it, because that, ha again, has a kind of idea in it. But I think the most important thing we can do uh, is listen. Um, when we listen, we can learn. Do you have any life principle or something that... Uh just uh, inspire you to live the life you're living or something that you say to yourself, something like values, principles, something that uh, yeah, makes the, gives you a structure. Um, I don't think I do. Okay. How do you cope with the unknown or uncertainty? Oh, I, I celebrate it. <laughs> well, well, I don't cope with it. I celebrate it. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you share? Um, so, what is what is for you? Do you have any essential uh, recommendation or advice or something that you feel personal about it for creating a life that thrives? 
Hmm. I always make a joke when someone asks me for advice, I say, take my advice. I'm not using it. <laughs> uh, that's a kind of a phrase that goes back to something I heard when I was a kid. Like, uh, if you want to, uh, let's say I have a shovel and I and I'm leaning on it. <laughs> And I'm tr maybe I'm trying to dig a hole, and, and but I'm taking a rest, and I'm leaning on my shovel, and someone says, hey, uh, do you have any uh, advice about shoveling? <laughs> and I say, here, take my advice, <laughs> take my shovel, I'm not using it. Um, so there's that little uh, levity, perhaps, but... Um, your question has inside of it some very interesting sticky things. We can sort of pull apart this stickiness. You use the word life. And so many of us, we, we love this word, we love this idea, and yet the idea of my life becomes a barrier to the experience, the actual experience of, of life moment to moment. It's not my life. It's just life. Um, so maybe advice could be stop or let go of your tendency to think about your life or to want something for your life or to retell stories about your life or to tell other people about your life. Let go of that. And then if you can let go of that, What's left is your life. Your life is what's left over when you stop thinking and fantasizing about this imaginary life. And, it, and your life is just this. Just this. That's your life. <laughs> you can't hold it. You can't predict it. You can't, you can't even talk about it, really. Tim, uh, we're going to jump on to the last part, which is the rapid fire questions, like quick. Uh, oh my God. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, what are your top three books? Um, there's two books that I love. One is called Swampland Flowers. And uh, the other one is... Uh, It's called Bird Lives, which is an autobiography of Charlie Parker, which I read probably about 20 times when I was younger, although it's very inaccurate. The third book is the book that I think is the most profoundly important book, uh, and it doesn't live on a bookshelf. So it lives inside of you. It's the book that, of your karma, and it's the book that must be read. It must be looked at very, very closely uh, rather than any other uh, book that might be on your bookshelf. The song you have played the most? Oh, the song I've played the most. I don't know if there's a name for it. It's, a, it's, it's basically a blues. And it's sort of um, what comes out when I pick up the instrument and it, it flows through me all the time. But it may not have a name. It could have a thousand names or no name. Your weirdest habit? My which kind? Where, your weirdest habit? My weirdest habit? habit? Yes. Oh, uh, I speak in funny voices. <laughs> I have a, I have inside of my mind, I have a character, uh, a, a, a hundred characters of cartoon characters, uh, little people, little, little characters that are, are all part of me. They're all part there. And, and I use funny voices to express different things. Your most successful failure? Ah, perhaps it's sitting in this conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> your most expensive success ah being uh 
taking my first breath, which could also be considered my most expensive failure. <laughs> <laughs> Any skill do you want to master? I want to learn how to play the trumpet. Wow. I probably never I probably never will but flugelhorn actually the, the slightly larger trumpet there's something about the sound of it that just moves me very much um the flugelhorn is a it's like a, a smoky woman's voice or something I love that um a word sorry sorry I interrupt you no 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 it's okay it's a okay. word a word to coin what you are a word to coin what I am No, there's no word. No word. No. Word can't touch. It. Words can't touch it. <laughs> no, man, that doesn't make me special. That just makes it means that words can't touch it. What would you be? Your top three best cons counselors, La al dead or alive? My top three best counselors. Yes, dead or alive. Dead or alive. Well, to be honest with you, I, I, every day, just about, I wish I could um, ask Ted Green another question about music. Um, I think it would be very interesting to be counseled by uh, a much younger version of myself, like maybe the, the, the ten-year-old Timmy. I think. I think the 10 year old Timmy might have some very uh, informative things to share. Um, oh, there's so many, there's so many characters in the Zen literature that I think would be, would be interesting to meet and to hang out with. Um, But there's one person in the Zen literature that I would love to meet. Uh, it's a woman who, the story of the woman who sends her daughter ah. to, to test the monk's mind after she supported him for 10 years. The hermitage. Yeah, the, the, the woman burns down the hermitage. In this story, um, a, a woman who had been supporting a monk for 10 years, a meditation monk, in giving him food and clothing and, and a place to practice, sends her daughter with some specific instructions to go and give this monk a big kiss and and see how he responds. And uh, then when the daughter comes back to the mother to report what the monk said, the, the mother goes back down to the hermitage and burns it to the ground and kicks the monk out. And said, and said, for 10 years, I've been supporting a demon. Get out of here. I would like to meet her. <laughs> um, what is, uh, what is any, any trick you have learned recently? Any trick? Um, maybe that tricks don't help. Mm. And the uh, last rapid fire question, who do you recommend to interview next? Who do I recommend that you interview next? Yeah. Um, Alive, please. <laughs> yeah, 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 must be it'd be a short interview or so, or a quiet interview anyway. Um, your true self. I'm gonna do it. Good. Is there anything else you want to add, uh, Tim? Well, I want to thank you. It's been a really, really beautiful conversation. Um, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share, uh, whether it will help anybody or open anybody's um, mind a little bit. I don't know, um, and I hope it does. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing because, um, as I said earlier, the most uh, 
uh, open way to learn is to listen, and you're creating um, the opportunity for people to listen. That's without listening, your your podcast has no meaning. You know, uh, brilliant things or stupid things can be said. I always say, if Buddha was sitting on your shoulder, whispering every wisdom in your into your ear, it won't help you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if you listen just for one moment to your true nature, that will help you more than any Buddha. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, open my mouth here and share stories. And I wish you all the best. I wish you to continue, stay safe, stay healthy, and deepen in your practice. I know you're a practicing person, so uh, we can't uh, underestimate the, the potential uh, for uh, self-discovery and uh, becoming increasingly authentic uh, by looking into what it is to be a human being moment to moment. Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, my final request is, what question would you ask to the audience? What are you? What are you? That's the question for all of you listeners out there. What are you? And I'm going to, to finish and to close the interview with Tim Lurch. A fantastic interview and enlightened, enlightening interview with this. Tim definitely had an impact on me picking up a guitar and sticking with it. I started at about at the same time and as I say it up there, and I always loved country style music, and so I was interested mostly in the tele. I started searching YouTube for great tele players, and first stumbled upon Arlen Roth, uh, then Danny Gatton, Fred, etc. And I also found Tim, and it totally cemented my passion for the tele. He has uh, he he's had a big impact on me sticking with the guitar, and he also plays so tastefully and effortlessly that is so recommended. His classic style, the way he communicates as well as he is playing, really makes me feel like I can get better and better and better. I bet he's amazing as a teacher, as others have testified. I used to watch all his demo clips over and over again. And I could add to this that uh, also Tim is a really generous, generous, kind and compassionate human being. That's Tim Lerch, at least for this testimonial and for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, and for all the listeners, I hope you get at least one thing and use it, recommend it, share it to others. Take this podcast and, and, and share it with the people you love the most and the people you think it's going to need it. I'm sure there is people that is thirsty for this for, for this sharing, for this listening, for this uh, wisdom that, uh, like practical wisdom that Tim shared with us from music, from life, from Zen. Um, thank you for being in Disrupt Everything podcast series. Uh, this is the way to disrupt yourself, is to do it yourself. Because if you don't do it by yourself, someone will come and will do it on anything or something will come and do it. And this always will be more painful and won't be so satisfactory as doing it by yourself. So guess what? You've been disrupted. Thank you for being here. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs>